So, our sustainable fish is the silver ape. And I focused on hypothesis number one to find out if the fish was successful due to good management practices. So the Silver Hake is overseen by the New England Fisheries Management Council as part of the Small National Species Management Plan, which includes the northern and southern populations of Silver Hake, as well as the offshore and red hake. And all of these species were grouped in under Amendment 12 in the year 2000. And uh, their management is carried out by the Small Mesh Multi-Species Committee, which is comprised of multiple NEFMC officials and uh, fishery stakeholders. And they uh, vote on new amendments pretty regularly and meet up and have a chance to engage in dialogue about the fishery. <coughs> so the uh, management evolves and adjusts over time to uh, keep up with new developments. So the fishery began in the mid-1800s and it has uh, since peaked at 351,000 metric tons in 1962, but has declined due to decreases in local and international fishing pressure. Uh, it was declared overfished in 1997, and uh, management began in the late 1990s. You can see after 1997, the uh, landings have started to decrease. So the, uh, the silver hake is fished with otter trawl nets, and uh, they're, as part of management, they've enforced gear restrictions. And so mesh size restrictions under framework adjustment 32 included that, uh, well, they started because of concern for high juvenile, juvenile bycatch uh, as a result of, or yeah, and then they would die or just be discarded. And then the original gear restrictions uh, mesh that was larger than 2.5 inches could catch up to 7,500 pounds, but uh, vessels with smaller mesh could only catch 3,500 pounds. So it was in a fisherman's best interest to use larger mesh and let uh, smaller fish escape. Since then, uh, the hard limit has increased to 3 inches. Ideally, 12 inch openings would be best for the fishery, but it is a gradual process. And they're included, uh, included in current restrictions. Uh, fishermen must get permits from a local manager. They can only fish in set geographic locations and uh, only during specific seasons. So these steps really uh, take action against juvenile uh, bycatch, and they, however, without uh, damaging the targeting of adult species within the fishery. So overall, hake stocks have increased in abundance in uh, recent years. In the 2010 stock assessment, northern silver hake was reported as not overfished, and its mean biomass index was 6.79 kilograms per tow, <coughs> above its 6.63 target. Uh, and the uh, limits on silver hake catches have gradually been decreasing over time as well. So for allowable biological catch, uh, uh, in 2009, for the northern stock and silver hake, it was 1,000, and for southern, uh, nearly 7,000. And since then, it's just increased tremendously. 2012 is nearly 14,000 for north, 34,000 for south, and then for the years of 2013 to 2015, they've just kept the same numbers, uh, 24,000 and 31,000 for north and south, respectively. And then, uh, most recently, the, in the 2013 stock assessment, the Northern Stocks Biomass Index was 15.72 kilograms per tow. So it's only uh, increasing according to these estimates. So this indicates that populations are rebuilding and are responding well to uh, management under uh, standard mesh size and requirements. So another helpful tool to gauge how a fishery is performing is B over BMSY, and as you can see from the graph, since 2008, the northern uh, stock of Silver Hake has increased tremendously, uh, well above the one minimum for a healthy and sustainable fishery. So it's reached about 2.54, well ahead of the southern population, and although the uh, southern population has kind of plateaued a bit, it has shown a recent increase a little similar to the water. So this could indicate that the fishery is responding well to good management and is rebounding back uh, with low juvenile bycatch. So 
all of these uh, restrictions and permits and the set seasons are part of the Small Mesh Multi-Species Management Plan. And so it applies to all uh, stocks of cake. So if looking at this graph, one could assume that there could be similar growth across the board for species. However, when compared to red hake, their B over BMSY has uh, shown really stochastic growth. It was all right for a while, but then the northern stock crashed and has uh, gone through various ups and downs. And same with the southern, it has that huge spike and then that huge crash. So if the management uh, practices were really working for both fisheries, we would expect to see uh, level increases in B over B and SY matching that of the northern population of Silver Hake. Uh, however, since the uh, same management isn't as successful for a similar species and a similar geographic location, it's more likely that something else is responsible for the uh, northern Silver Hake's success. Okay, so I focused on hypothesis number two, which was that the fishery is sustainable is of biological characteristics of the species. So the first topic I focused on was their reproduction. Um, it was found that eggs and fry were found throughout their range and throughout the year from Nova Scotia to New York, suggesting that they could spawn multiple times a year. Those are some cute little fry. Never ever that cute again. <laughs> um, even though it's unknown how many times a year they spawn, uh, it is known that they have a huge spawning event in the Gulf of Maine. Um, this uh, makes uh, this summer congregation makes them one of the most important summer fisheries in the Gulf of Maine. Um, it's thought um, that they release their eggs in very cold water in about 40 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, but the eggs actually need to be in warmer upper layers to incubate and hatch. And so they need to be in water about 50 to 55 degrees. Um, that means the eggs have to be buoyant, and they're subject to a lot of predation. Uh, and unfortunately, it's actually unknown the exact amount of eggs that they produce. Um, this lack of knowledge of the eggs per batch and the unknown amount of spawning seasons leads to an uncertainty in their fecundity and really questions the overall sustainability of the fishery. So silver egg larvae start off really small. That that's actually a pretty old, a pretty old larvae, probably a couple, uh, one or two months old, because they start out at about 2.8 millimeters, like we saw in the past slide, and they stay in uh, pretty shallow and warmer water. Uh, and they have pretty high predation mortality as well as bycatch mortality, as we discussed. Um, the fry do migrate deeper as they get larger uh, to stay in the safe. Um, even of the bottom, but uh, that's still a pretty dangerous migration, especially for a fish that's one to three uh, inches long. Apart from that, uh, silver hake do grow fairly quickly. Uh, the males reach sexual maturity about at 28, at 24 centimeters, which is about nine inches long, and the females reach maturity at 27 centimeters, which is 10 and a half inches long. Uh, these lengths are normally reached within the second to third year of their life. Uh, unfortunately, silver egg only live to be 10 to 12 years old, which gives them only a few years of reproducing capability. Um, the short reproducing capabilities and dangerous early life history question the sustainability because of low levels of offspring. Low levels of offspring survive to reproduce, and they aren't able to reproduce that. Um, so they range from uh, North Carolina to Nova Scotia. Uh, the northern stock is from Cape Cod north um, in that section. Uh, they do migrate inshore in the spring and summer because they are aggregating to spawn. And this actually makes them extremely easy to capture due to increased fishing technology. Uh, in the fall and winter, they, oh, I'm still there. Oh. <laughs> In the fall and winter, they do head offshore to catch uh, the warmer Gulf Stream waters, which you can see on the red line. Um, and within their range, the highest concentrations are between Cape Sable and New York, although that's changing. Get that uh, Silver Hate's range is expansive enough that if the <coughs> population declines, uh, the remainder of the population will not be damaged. Um, 
range is an aspect of their biology that is not too troubling, besides the fact that they are much easier to catch in the summer. Uh, silver hake can be found in a wide range of temperatures and depths, uh, but it's often thought that they spend the majority of their day on the bottom and spend the night fishing. Um, while the former is sometimes true, sometimes their vertical movements from the bottom to the near surface are completely governed by um, prey movements. Uh, being found in a great, at great depths makes it harder to study and determine the stock size and other habitat, habitat characteristics of the species. It's also hard to survey them because trawling along the bottom damages not only the technology but the ocean floor. Right. Silver hake are pretty voracious uh, piscivores. They prey upon young herring, mackerel, alewives, haddock, silversides, and pretty much all young Gulf of Maine species. Uh, Sometimes they are so concerned with hunting schools of fish, they will actually strand themselves on beaches, trying to herd uh, fish into uh, shoals. Uh, another dangerous fishing habit, uh, habit that they have is they, uh, they are highly cannibalistic. <laughs> if uh, prey species go down, they can eat almost, sometimes their com stomach composition, composition can be 25% silver hake by the way. Uh, as said, increased cannibalism may be attributed to uh, lack of other prey species, and uh, yeah. their diet is too high in um, popular, uh, popular and overfished species that they have to resort to this kind of uh, behavior. Uh, this also displays that even though the species is not allowed to be caught in abundance, if their prey is still not being managed properly, the species will suffer and continue to prey upon themselves. Uh, this slide just uh, shows the male and female silver hake stomach composition by weight. Uh, they're supposed to have higher fish concentration uh, composition by weight. Uh, the females still have a very high composition because they're larger, more predatory, and need more energy to eat. Um, but they've started to diversify a little bit, eating a lot of crustaceans and mollusks. Um, okay. So, a high demand for the species in the 1960s and 70s eventually led to a steady decline in landings. And even with landings declining, the demand for silver hake was still pretty high. Um, this led to a price increase. As you can see, even with landings declining, the total uh, value of the market was not to uh, hurt by the uh, decrease in landings because the price went from one cent per pound to 62 cents per pound in 2000. Um, and um, since uh, 2000 when the fish was uh, declared overfished, um, uh, the landings and price have gone down uh, due to uh, just you can't fish them and there's no demand. Uh, current high pro projections of B over BMSY can be explained by the almost non-existent landings, and this suggests that the fishery might be sustainably fished because there is almost no fishing. And, but it doesn't mean that this is a necessarily healthy stock. Okay, so then uh, I'm going to talk about hypothesis three, which was the fishery is sustainable because of some larger problem that's not being addressed. So one of the first things I found looking into the species was the fact that there's this really common confusion between silver hake's um, species and physiology and offshore hake. So when fishermen are hauling in um, these type of trawls, there's often no differentiation between silver hake and offshore hake. It's just sort of landed as whatever is most convenient at the time. This can mean that um, particularly so offshore hake overlaps the most strongly with southern silver hake stocks, just in terms of range. And so that means that in southern areas, particularly like south of Long Island, um, in that general area, that <laughs> offshore hake is often landed as southern silver hake stocks, which can mean that, um, depending on fisheries and data and that sort of thing, that we're actually recording larger populations of southern silver hake stocks that are actually inexistent because we're, you know, sort of boosting that with offshore hake numbers. And then the same goes for the northern silver hake stocks. So a lot of um, offshore hake are actually landed as northern silver hake 
in these northern extended range, meaning that fishing pressure on northern Silver Hake may actually be underreported because a lot of it's coming in as under this other sort of fishing label. So that kind of confusion adds um, a huge amount of uncertainty to fisheries dependent data that's often used to calculate things like the overview must fly. Um, on top of this, there's also, so we mentioned that there are northern and southern silver hake stocks. There's also actually a Canadian stock that's not part of this fisheries management program. And the level of intermixing between these three stocks, so the southern and dark blue, the northern, and that kind of purplish maroon, and then the light purple, um, the extent to which these intermix is actually almost completely unknown, um, which could leave, again, a lot of uncertainty in terms of the fact that they're managed as separate stocks right now and the extent of mixing could really um, change um, how the health of these stocks and, and also, again, like those fisheries dependent data that could indicate um, specific, perhaps, migrations or exchanges between these wouldn't necessarily be picked up as such. It might be picked up as a decline in one stock as opposed to um, an actual just migration or shifting of stocks. So intermixing adds another layer of uncertainty to the management of the system. On top of that, there's also early indications of a northern shift in silver cake stocks. So we've had declines in southern stocks in recent years, and also increases in northern um, silver cake stocks, which could uh, be directly related in the sense that as fish move um, from the south to the north, their catchability in terms of all these trawl surveys and fisheries dependent data changes. And so we're just catching them in different places and um, potentially recording that as actual declines or increases in abundance rather than what it might be. So this map you saw before on one of John's slides, and so this is actually a heat map of kilograms per tow of Silver Hake, and this first map is from 1968 to 1972. And so you can see that most um, of the Silver Hake population is concentrated below the Gulf of Maine, actually just off the coast of sort of Long Island area, um, and that's where the highest concentration is. And then by 2003 to 2008, um, this has changed drastically, and there's now a much higher concentration of Silver Hake in the Gulf of Maine. And so this is just reiterating that idea that there could be um, a northern shift in Silver Hake that's affecting um, our fisheries dependent data for the stock. On top of that, so <laughs> looking into other things that could be sort of um, impacting the sustainability of Silver Hake. Silver Hake has no legal fishing. There's no other sort of um, dirty things going on. So I started looking at Silver Hake BMS, BMSY thresholds. This is from 1970 to 2015. You may notice that there's not a drastic change anywhere along this line. So this would indicate that it stayed pretty stable, and they've actually used the same number um, from 1973, which was kind of like a peak in stocks and landing, uh, up until 2007 when it suddenly dropped just a little bit, just ever so slightly lower, a couple of tenths of a point, really. Um, and that really, that change only indicates that they essentially thought that the stock was doing really well and was at a stable place and that they could lower the threshold. Um, so this, in terms of changing sustainability, not a huge impact, right? This, similarly, um, is a graph showing total allowable catch and landings from 1972 to about 2011. And you can see that in 1970, although the fishery wasn't under this management plan that Ryan mentioned, 1970 there was, um, there were some sort of preliminary allowable catch um, criteria and landings exceeded that. And then since then have remained pretty well underneath the total allowable, total allowable catch um, uh, threshold. And so again, looking at this data, you might be inclined to think, well, they've been underneath their total allowable catch. That means that there hasn't been huge impacts on the stock in terms of health of the stock or size, and that everything's going pretty well. And so this, in a lot of ways, would seem to support the fact that this fishery is sustainable. However, when you start looking at it, as John was mentioning, there's been a severe decline in fishing pressure, which could indicate that in the 1970s and even the 1990s, when Brian was talking about that demand was so high that actually fishing became unsustainable because there was this huge pressure on it. And so um, the decline in the apparent sustainability um, that we're seeing right now could just be to, to a sort of crash in demand for, for the fish itself. There's also this sort of large issue of age truncation within the population. So it's really uncommon to find silver hate three years old or more, which is a huge um, sort of change, drastic change in the past like decade or so, and um, could really implicate, um, could really uh, have changes for the kind of new fish is larger, there's the big old fat females sort of acronym, so larger older fish could have more eggs and um, play a large role in the recruitment rates for the fishery. And to kind of emphasize this, we have 
two, I have two pictures. Um, the first is this guy named Eric who had the state um, record for silver heat, caught in 1995, and it was 4.51 pounds. And so he looks pretty happy, that's a decent-sized fish. And then in 2006, you have this guy who caught a silver heat that he's pretty proud of, that is roughly 1.5 pounds. And this on the website that I found it on was labeled as a pretty nice catch for the time. And so although the data on paper and a lot of the total allowable catch and the BMSY thresholds um, seem to indicate that this fishery has um, sustainable characteristics, in fact, due to age truncation and um, some of these other factors, it may not be. And what we may be seeing is actually partially a shifting of baselines and what we understand is, is a healthy fishery. And so these um, things in terms of age truncation are really not being taken into account in terms of how the fishery is managed. All right, so to summarize, uh, for hypothesis number one, the fishery is sustainable because of uh, good management. There are good management practices in place, such as uh, set seasons, uh, set locations, and gear restrictions, such as mesh sizes. Uh, it is not declared overfished, and the allowable biological catch has only increased over time, uh, suggesting that the fishery has rebuilt itself. However, when compared with the southern uh, stock of silver hake and the uh, red hake, uh, who are managed under similar or managed under identical practices, their success is not as tremendous or just completely absent. So it's more likely that while management isn't hurting the northern stock of silver hake, uh, its success is probably due to something else. Okay, for hypothesis two, biological characteristics. Um, with uh, unknown number of spawning seasons and unknown number of eggs, it's, um, the fecundity is really questionable, and um, especially with their short lives. Uh, their feeding habits, uh, especially cannibalism and the lack of prey species from overfishing, has really been harmful to them. And their lack of demand currently is overshadowing what is probably an unhealthy stock. Okay, and so finally for hypothesis three, we talked about all these layers of uncertainty with misidentification between silver hake and offshore hake, the unknown intermixing of stocks between the three major stocks, the northern, the southern, and the Canadian, and then also this potential um, for shifting baselines just in terms of what we understand as a sustainable fishery and a healthy silver hake stock, specifically related to age truncation. And so because of um, all these factors, we sort of decided that hypothesis one is probably the least likely or the least supportive of um, the fishery sustainability overall. Hypothesis two we thought was a large contributor in some ways to the sustainability of um, the silver cake, but also the unknowns kind of making it uh, another important factor in why it may not actually be sustainable in terms of unknown fecundity. And then we decided that hypothesis three was probably the most likely cause for why we have reason to doubt the sustainability of silver cake um, and why it perhaps needs more research and more more data collection to establish something other than just a simple number of 2.45 um, as a measure of its system. And this picture is just a really nice, like, um, old shot of the hate fishery on the left. research on the Canadian stuff? No, no, didn't touch it. Because <laughs> our stock is just the Northern Silver Hake, and basically, I mean, it's managed under the whole different system, essentially. Um, but yeah, the only thing that really got at it at all was this idea of intermixing, and there were a lot of hypotheses that thought that there was probably actually a good bit of exchange between the Northern Silver Hake stuff and the Canadian stuff. <clears throat> I have a few. Like, if anyone else, anyone else? I, I think you ended with saying um, that, that if we go back to the conclusion slide, maybe that the lack of demand was overshadowing what's actually an unhealthy stock. Specifically, if you were in charge of management, specifically what metrics would you use to judge whether or not it goes back to being a healthy stock? In other words, what would you look at for a 10-year plan and say, this is the metric in which I want to see change? Because the metrics we have seem to indicate it's actually doing well. Okay. Um, 
have fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wouldn't want to uh, just have plantings increase. This, you don't want to see plantings to be like the same as they were in the 70s or the 60s. I guess we would just need more fisheries independent data and stock assessments to see what the actual biomass of the fishery is uh, versus just basing it off of fishery dependent data, uh, which is what they've kind of been doing in the past. It's only uh, seen as having a high B over the MSY because there's no fishing really. Also too, yeah, so the B over B over B MSY um, value that is 2.45 is actually just a proxy. And it's a proxy because they have very little data about a lot of the other biological factors in terms of, um, you know, intermixing and kind of all these things. And they, um, so essentially, like just what John said, I feel like there just needs to be more effort put in the research about um, how these stocks actually operate rather than just, I feel like right now it's, it's based on a lot of assumptions. As a proxy, so that, that, that metric, B over BMSY, is not based on the spring and fall Northeast multi species trawl survey? It is based on that survey, but there's a difference between proxy values, and this gets into specifics on like the algorithms of how they actually calculate BMSY that I'm not actually aware, I don't know those. But um, as what I've been, my impression after reading the papers, and especially in the reports on this, is just essentially that a lot of other fisheries do actually obviously have BMSYs that are proxies, and that this one has a proxy value because we're lacking data of some sort. Mm -hmm. So that just seems to add to the uncertainty. Right. And as you said, even the BMSY value is probably going to be, even if it is more data driven, based off of fisheries dependent data rather than fisheries dependent data. So if you had few hundred thousand dollars to put into that research, how do you think you would, how do you think you would apply that? Um, I think I would start by laying a better base in terms of studying intermixing of stocks. I think there would have to be some change regulations about how silver meat you're landed in terms of offshore meat versus silver meat. That one seems like kind of a big sticking point to me in terms of how those data might be skewed. Um, so, yeah, laying a better baseline in terms of particularly intermixing stocks and the rate of fecundity for these fish. And then based on that, it's not to say that the MRBMSY is not a useful tool. I think it is. I think the number that it, we're coming up with now is just not necessarily the most accurate um, representation of the Any other Great, and I guess, and I guess for you, based <laughs> on the introduction that you gave, which is, which is great, um, I'm curious what historical ecology might have to tell us if we look even farther back about these populations. I, I'm not sure that was actually part of what you looked into, um, but for Lauren's sake, I'm wondering what you think uh, 100 or 200 years of history might be able to tell us about what these stocks should be uh, should be like. Well, it's a little back, but uh, the slide with the uh, landings over historical time showed that they just had massive numbers and kind of like the peak of the fishery in the mid-century. And uh, it did start in the 1800, and so it is. Uh, it was a decently popular whitefish, similar to cod, and it was uh, an intensively fish New England species. So uh, I think, based on that, uh, and seeing the trajectory of other heavily fished New England species, uh, it would be very difficult for it to rebound in like such a short time as the uh, fisheries-dependent data seems to say that it has. Uh, I think it'd be closer to other uh, overfished stocks that haven't quite, that still need more time, and that the uh, massive amount of uncertainty that uh, Cleo looked at kind of contributes to the uh, uh, not entirely inaccurate, but uh, vague sets around uh, the levels that uh, gauge a success. Yeah. Does anyone else have any further questions? Well, good answers, thanks. And I just want to recognize one thing, Cleo, which is um, when you put up the heat map slides, yeah. I think uh, you did a really great job of explaining what's on the board, what the axes say, and what it means. So it's really important to have the axes labeled and, and also to say that verbally when you're giving a presentation. Really nice, nice job on that. Thanks. <laughs>
It's a relatively young fishery established in the late 1960s, and as of 2015, its current fee of review and squad was is 2.61. Um, so just starting with hypothesis one, that it's sustainable due to good management. Um, it's co-managed by the state of Alaska and the um, National Marine Fisheries Service, and they manage it through a fisheries management plan that's set forth by the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. And this FMP defers fishery management to the state of Alaska, and as a result, um, the state is responsible for opening and closing the fisheries, setting total level catches, size limits, um, and guideline harvest levels, and you know, all observer coverage, licenses, permits, etc. cetera. Um, and specifically what it also does is it sets pre-season guideline harvest levels that are based on mat the mature male harvest rate of 40%, and also establishes a minimum legal size for the tanner crab, that's 5.5 inches of carapace width. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, it's bit, what's unique about this fishery is that oftentimes they'll, res they'll restrict it to either east and west longitudes that are based on king crab stock levels because frequently they are managed together and data collection is very connected. Um, but then on the other side of this is the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is authorized to establish the crab rationalization program as well as the central fish habitat. Um, and what the crab rationalization program is essentially, it was implemented in 2005, um, and it was intended to limit access by decreasing fishing capacity through decreasing the number of vessels and processors in Alaska um, to improve conservation and management. And kind of essentially what the program is, is a voluntary cooperative IFQ program. Um, and then in terms of the essential fish habitat, this is a part of the 1976 Magnuson-Stevens Act which kind of preserves their spawning habitat. Um, and then, in addition, the Magnuson-Stevens Act also requires that 10% of the catch goes to a community development quota. Uh, and so this is specific kind of for the crab rationalization program um, so just kind of overview. Uh, and so moving on to kind of enforcement and compliance, there's very close management of stock size, and guidelines are set to maximize both meat yield and minimize the handling of soft shell crab. And as a result, also only male crabs are harvested um, to ensure kind of the survival and production of female crabs. And all the data that they use is based off of an annual bottom trawl survey of the Bering Sea that's done by NOAA, and both NIMS and of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game use this information to determine the status of stocks and set the harvest levels. But as a result of kind of constantly updating their information based on these annual trawls, um, the fishery is subject to very frequent closures because a lot of the management is based on a short-term analysis of biomass. And um, in terms of management, this is they've been trying to kind of fix this issue through the crab rationalization program, um, which, as I said, is intended to limit access. But um, as I'm going to talk about a little bit later, it's kind of had mixed results. It's been very short term and hasn't really seen a lot of benefits in the long run. Uh, and so this is just kind of like a brief overview of the history of management. Because what's interesting is that it's a pretty young fishery, but it's already been closed three times um, from 1985 to 1986. 1997 to 2004, and then 2009 was the crater of fish, and then they shut it down again in 2014. Um, <coughs> and so, kind of what's unique about this fishery also is that it's very small and domestic, so management is sound in that they can shut down the fishery when they need to when it's being overfished, but it, the stocks aren't really managed with long term goals in mind. Um, and so, this is just kind of a graph that shows based from 2005 to 2011. Um, tanner crabs are measured often in mature male biomass because the fishery shuts down so often that they don't have a lot of estimates of B over BMSY. But as you can see, they started the crab rationalization program in 2005, um, and then mature male biomass increased until it kind of hit a peak in 2008, 2009, and then crashed again. Uh, and then it was considered overfished in 2009. They reset the minimum legal size. The fishery kind of increased again, and then in 2014 was shut down. So it's very kind of boom and bust. Um, and so another issue historically has been uh, tanner crabs getting caught in bycatch, especially in the ground fish fishery. And that's something the state of Alaska has kind of struggled to balance both the ground fish fishery and the tanner crab fishery. Um, 
but overall tanner trap species are a prohibited catch under Alaska state guidelines, and this is from the commercial fishing regulations, and they've also implemented a limited observer program, but more effectively, they um, established a lot of very strict uh, trawl restrictions because at the time, trawls had an 80% delayed mortality rate, which was you know, very difficult to overcome. But I found that this figure really um, was indicative of the kind of management that the state of Alaska uses and that you can see the, um, the trawl fishery is the red one and by 2013 it's essentially a non-issue, especially compared to 2004, 2005. Um, and what also helped a lot is that they discovered that midwater trawls, which are kind of the um, most common use of trawl in the Bering Sea region, have become a lot more common and there's significantly less bycatch with midwater trawls. Uh, but then the actual fishery uses crab pots and trawls, um, and in crab pots what's been an issue is that frequently tanner crabs are subject to decompression and air bubble disease, and that's something they're working with right now by limiting the number of crab pots. Um, and then the trawl fishery, what they've done is they have two triggered closures in the fishery, um, and these are triggered based on the time and area to maximize the spawning rates of these crabs, and once again all of this data is based off of the annual trawl survey from NOAA. Um, and so as you can see, this goes back to the crab rationalization program. There are 10 crab species managed by this, and they're all in the Bering Sea and the Aleutian Islands area. And so the tanner crab has been classified as tier three, which is fairly reliable estimates based on these trawl surveys and just the level of management. Um, and they all go all the way up to tier five, which is essentially they have basically no information, um, and so they're just kind of you know, struggling to manage it. Uh, and so I thought this was indicative of kind of man the close management that is done by the tanner crab in that, you know, they have a sound understanding of its biology. They frequently shut it down to allow it to rebuild. Um, and so while in the short term it's sustainable, in the long term, you know, not so much. Um, but yeah, it's essentially overall sustainable due to good So, moving on to uh, hypothesis two, which is the fishery is sustainable because of biological characteristics of the species or the characteristics of the fishery. So, stock structure and spatial distribution um, the species are primarily found near the Bering Sea, so the continental shelf of the Bering Sea, which is near Alaska. Um, so, they're primarily found kind of over here on the coast of Alaska. Um, and their range can extend as far south as the Oregon coast and as far west as uh, the coasts of Japan. Um, so, so current scientific evidence suggests that there are two distinct population segments of this species, um, but it's important to note that there are ocean currents that will kind of bring um, the crab larvae right through the Aleutian Islands, kind of to more central Bering Sea, um, which causes for a lot of hybridization between these population segments, um, which offers an explanation as to why these are usually managed as a single unit, um, and their range is also limited to kind of this um, central area because it's non-migratory, so um, just kind of dealing with the Bering Sea area. So some of their general is habitat and food preferences. Um, tanner crabs are usually found in more benthic, muddier substrates, um, which helps provide them with protection, so especially juveniles um, will brace themselves into the silt. Um, and they can occupy depths of almost 450 meters um, below sea level, um, even though Adult predation rates are typically lower at shallower depths, um, and they're also very. They have a very diverse food um, preference, so they eat pretty much anything. Um, and so a lot of adults are going to consume a lot of infernal prey, so bivalves, worms, gastropods, etc. Um, and these juveniles will also consume uh, detrital material, which is often found in kind of these muddier substrates, which offers an additional reason why they um, will prefer kind of more uh, silty benthic areas. And so some of their biological characteristics and historic recovery, um, so like most crustaceans, they have an exoskeleton, which is made of chitin and calcium carbonate. Um, and so in order to grow, they need to undergo these uh, periodic moltings. Um, so um, they'll kind of have this terminal molt, which is that last time that they'll molt, and that uh, determines their, uh, at that point, they'll become sexually um, mature. So um, the one problem that uh, kind of having an exoskeleton 
poses is that um, immediately after molting, these crabs will kind of be soft shelled um, until their shell hardens. So this soft shell period kind of uh, will make them considerably more vulnerable to uh, predation. Also, um, tanner crabs will form really high density mating aggregations, so just kind of these huge mounds of females that will um, come together around 150 meters below sea level. Um, and it's thought that this is in order to maximize the reproductive potential of females and will actually attract males to these huge mating aggregations. Um, and it's also important to note that both um, pruning paris and multi-paris female crabs are able to store male sperm for up to two years, um, which kind of gives further reason as to why um, why there's only uh, you're only allowed to catch males. Um, and just so um, pruning paris females refers to um, female crabs that have not yet carried a previous clutch of eggs. So these are females that have just undergone terminal molt um, and haven't actually had any young yet, and then multi-paris females are uh, female crabs that actually have carried eggs in previous years. Um, and so despite these uh, past crashes, um, tanner crabs have kind of shown the ability to, to recover slowly um, once the fishery is shut down, um, which we can possibly attribute to this kind of reproductive resilience of the crab, primarily because of their uh, the female's ability to store sperm. So just a little bit more on their fecundity and reproduction. Um, so tanner crabs will molt up to 17 times before reaching sexual maturity. And this can take anywhere from six to eight years depending on um, whether it's a male or female crab. Um, even so, six to eight years is, is a relatively long time to reach sexual maturity, um, which will probably co kind of complicate that um, or counteract any benefits of reproductive resilience that they get from storing sperm. Um, females will reach sexual maturity, um, usually in an average carapace width of 68.8 millimeters, and males at um, 91.9 millimeters. Um, so obviously that takes a really long time. Um, despite that, they do have a really high fecundity, so once they do reach the age of sexual maturity, females will lay anywhere from 24,000 to 318,000 eggs per spawning event. Um, but also important to note that uh, premium pairs of females, so those females that have only care, uh, have never previously carried a clutch of eggs, are only about 62 to 70 percent as of a kind as multi pairs females. So when we look at the duration and magnitude of the fishery, um, so this graph we can see over the years, um, and then uh, in metric tons, um, that the landings have uh, really decreased over um, the past few years. Um, so this was in 1979 with uh, 59,206.4 metric tons. Um, and we can see that after that peak, there's really kind of uh, poor landing data. Um, they haven't really been able, they haven't really reached um, previous landing peaks. Um, and also important to note that this data is kind of patchy because as Danielle said, um, a lot of this data is kind of coupled with snow crab and king crab uh, data, so it's really hard to kind of find individualized data points on the tanner crab alone. Um, but the fact that these, uh, we see this crash and then um, the population haven't really been able to recover. Um, and then when looking at the market value, um, so recently the market value for crab was peaked in 2013 with an estimated 2.3 um, U.S. dollars per pound, and um, tanner crab fishery is usually regarded as a pretty commercially valuable fishery. Um, but it's really interesting to note that these price peaks coincide with the fishery closures, um, which just kind of highlight that um, kind of supply and demand aspect. So um, that as the species becomes more threatened, that the price is therefore also increasing. Okay, so we're obviously going to talk about. Hypothesis three, where the fishery appears to be sustainable due to a larger problem. So tanner crabs uh, are scavengers, they live on, on the bottom of the ocean, and they act as major recyclers. So they will walk around on this muddy uh, sediment on the bottom and sift through the particles and um, recycle nutrients through the system that way. Um, their major prey is size dependent, so larvae will typically eat things like phytoplankton and um, other detrital material that's uh, on the bottom or in the water column. Uh, whereas juveniles and adults are 
opportunistic on the on the board, so they will pretty much eat anything that falls right in front of them. Um, some of their major predators include things like ground fish, octopus, cod, halibut, and seals. Um, but however, uh, predation is really only a big issue for smaller crabs with carapace width of less than 30 millimeters, or crabs that are um, immediately post mold and have soft shells. So. Uh, these tanner crabs live in Barency, um, and this area has certainly been experiencing uh, increased forms of anthropogenic climate change, um, especially in the last half century. But the biggest, uh, the biggest changes to this system have actually been in the Arctic. So um, there's been this major loss of Arctic ice um, in the Arctic region, and this can be categorized by earlier breakups and later formations. So we, we're seeing earlier breakups in the spring, um, and later formations of ice packs in the fall. And this increases the amount of open sea water up in the Arctic, um, which results in an increased heat capacity up there. So with all this uh, open water, uh, the ocean is, uh, is able to increase the amount of heat that it can store. And then what happens is this heat then gets brought down into the Bering Sea, which consequently leads to warming of the Bering Sea and again, a loss of ice. And this warming can also result in shifts of species. So studies have shown that both inver invertebrate and vertebrate species are shifting north with these increase in temperatures. Um, however, this isn't a completely linear trend. So um, the Bering Sea has been experiencing warming, but also in recent years due to climate oscillations and current oscillations, it's also been experiencing some rapid cooling. So the, kind of the ice levels in the Bering Sea have been kind of fluctuating within the past three or four decades, depending on um, where the climate's at. And then, yeah, again, current oscillations um, can play a major role in this ecosystem, so they can shift around where the sea surface temperature is going, and this consequently shifts where the ice pack is. So with all these changing effects in the ocean, certainly these crabs um, are feeling some of these effects. So uh, with the increase in water temperature, uh, the larvae are shifting uh, around where they live. So larvae tend to aggregate around warmer areas of the ocean um, because it's easier for them to grow there. Um, and so with the sh shift in water temperature, we're possibly seeing northward trends due to the increased warming um, moving up in the northern part of the Bering Sea and the Bering Strait. Um, however, these crabs in their adult phase tend to try and live in colder water, um, and this is beneficial for them because this excludes their predators. So um, they typically live, like Santa said, around 450 meters, and the water down there is around zero degrees. Um, so they are basically specialists in that area, and their predators are not able to, uh, not able to coexist down there with them. And then finally, uh, with this cold water that they live in, this kind of restricts uh, their size, so they grow really slowly in this cold water. That's why it takes them so long um, to reach adulthood. And it also restricts their breeding time. So normally they can breed every one year, but in the colder water, they uh, can only breed every two years. Um, so I looked into some data for sequential depletion, and you can see here, these are some of the other commercially important crab species in the Bering Sea and their respective VO and VMSYs. So all these other species are at VO over VMSY values close to one, which suggests that these fisheries are being fished at their MSY currently. And then we have the Tanner crab at 2.61, which is this hyper, uh, hyper V over VMSY. So this kind of suggests that uh, some of these other species may be more commercially important, and so they uh, consequently are fished for more currently, more regularly, but the southern tanner crab um, kind of experiences these boom and bust cycles, so that could possibly explain why right now at least it's a 2.61 value. Um, I also looked into the changes in the fleet size. Um, so these figures here just show the amount of vessels um, and other associated effort with these crabs. So in the top figure, the the left half of that is when the fishery was closed from 1997 to 2004. And then here we have where it reopens. And so you can see that it only has four vessels that are allowed to fish for crabs in the, in the very opening of this first season. 
but then immediately it jumps up to 45 vessels in the next season, um, which would suggest that the fishery is healthy and uh, that they're ready to send fishermen out to go catch these crabs. But then almost immediately again, there's a sharp decline in the number of vessels, um, and then all the way down to four right before they close the fishery again recently. So this suggests that this hyper increase in efforts uh, seriously depletes these crabs um, when they open these seasons. And again, on the bottom here, it's sort of the same thing, where we have um, lots of vessels fishing for them when the seasons are open, and when it's closed, they completely drop off. Uh, I also looked at changes in size of these crabs. So this is kind of a, a cool snapshot of time from 2006 to 2012. And so on the first graph here, uh, we have uh, a majority, like around 40 or 50 percent of the population is having a carapace width of around 70 millimeters. Uh, and then in, in this figure up here in 2008, we can see that um, the population has shifted towards 100 millimeters. So this generation uh, right here is growing up and getting bigger here, but then you can see that the overfishing has dropped down from 50 to around 25 or 30 percent um, of the fishery. And then subsequently when, uh, when the fishery collapsed again in uh, 2009 and they shut it down, you can see in 2012 here that it's beginning to regrow again here with uh, large concentrations around 60 millimeters. So this again just kind of suggests this boom and bust nature of this fishery um, and how it's playing a part in the management. Finally, uh, we looked at, or I looked at some data over time. They only had the over BMSY data from 2008 onwards, so I chose this Fish Stock Sustainability Index as a metric instead because it was a little bit further back. Um, so the values of the index are, so a value of one represents that the overfish status of the fishery is known, two is that overfishing status is known, three is overfishing is not occurring, Four is stock biomass is over the overfishing threshold, and five is stock is above 80 percent of the MSY biomass. So, for a majority of the fishery, at least immediately after when it was reopened, before it was closed down again in um, the early 2010s, uh, you can see that the stock sustainability index is around three, suggesting that um, overfishing is not occurring. But then again, towards the latter years here. We can see that it drops down to two, suggesting that overfishing does occur, and then this is when the management comes in and shuts down the fishery. And then when this happens, you can see that in the later years here, the value jumps up to four, um, which suggests that, again, the population is rebounded and healthy again. Uh, yeah, so just to rank our hypothesis, you're right hypothesis one is first, um, because the fishery is very closely managed so with respond to overfishing by promptly shutting it down and allowing the stocks to rebuild when necessary. Um, in addition, there's less transboundary management. It's a very domestic fishery, very um, consolidated kind of in the United States of Alaska. Um, and it's such that facilitates the coordination and communication for more effective and sound um, so we ranked hypothesis two a second, the fishery sustainable due to biological characteristics of the species. Um, and so although this species has a really high fecundity, they're laying a lot of eggs, and these females have that ability to store sperm, um, they also have a really long time to, uh, they take a really long time to reach sexual maturity, so um, the kind of benefits of this high fecundity and kind of reproductive resilience is somewhat counteracted by how long it takes these species to even get there. So that's why we rank that second. And then we ranked hypothesis third three. Um, because although their environment is changing and we are seeing uh, heavy, or heavy increases in sea surface temperature, um, these species live so deep uh, that the conditions down there are changing at a much, much slower rate. And so these, uh, these crabs have actually shown pretty good resilience in, in the face of climate change. Um, and again, these other commercially important species are more heavily fished in the Bering Sea, so this kind of reduces a lot of the fishing pressure that's placed on these crabs. Cool. So, um, moving forward and kind of future uh, recommendations that we have, um, we found that the term sustainable was somewhat misleading um, for this crab species, um, mainly because resorting to closing uh, the fishery is 
the result of um, declining populations is not a sustainable way to manage a fishery. You can't just, you know, be like, oh, well, the stocks look pretty bad, just close it. It's not really a sustainable sort of long-term way to manage these species. Um, so the boom and bust is clearly a problem. Um, and also so that value 2.61 is also incredibly misleading because when you look at the B over BMSY um, data in previous years, we can really see that this is actually a very low value. And so the 2.61 can really be attributed to the fact that uh, the fishery is, is closed right now and so it's like really fish, uh, fishing pressure. Um, and further research um, is also necessary. Um, as of right now, there's not a lot of peer-reviewed literature on these crabs, and the peer-reviewed liter peer literature that there is is often coupled with um, kind of snow crab and king crab data. Um, and so we feel like this tanner crab could benefit from a lot more individualized research um, to kind of really assess its specific conservation needs and how we can manage this um, in an actually sustainable way in the future. <laughs> This may not be something that you looked into, but I was wondering if you found any um, papers or any research talking about if whether or not southern tanner crabs are experiencing the stress of climate change in any other way besides just like rain shifts. It's probably still too cold for things like shell disease or that sort of thing, but like, you know, are there yeah. any other indications? Of the I mean, stress? I know that the Bering Sea is definitely changing, but it's definitely not changing on the same scale as here. Right. Um, and I mean, I found a lot of uncertainty in terms of how it's changing. So. I read papers that said it was warming, and then I also read papers that said it was cooling. So I think that that has a lot to do with these large fluctuations in like currents and gyres over in the Pacific, um, and then also like the huge influence from the warm water from the Arctic coming into kind of it all plays a role. But in terms of like actual, yeah, there are barriers of it because they live so deep that they're just untouched. <laughs> So you brought up uh, earlier other species of crabs that seem to be fished at their B MSY or the, at their MSY. Uh, are they managed similarly, or do you know if they're managed similarly to the southern tanner crab? And so, uh, do they experience a similar kind of like boom bust and closure, like drastic cycles of that? Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, Daniel. I mean, they're all these species are like that's part of the problem. That they're like. There's little differentiation between the management of these species. Yeah, so basically, I didn't look too much um, details about the other species in the crab rationalization program, but all of the crabs in that are all kind of pretty similar. Um, and it kind of seems like because a lot of them are managed sort of together with the snow crab, the tanner crab, and the cane crab, they can kind of like shut one down and then no one really say anything because they have these known other species, then they'll just kind of, you know, just like pass them off to each other, but um, pass them off to each other. Yeah, and the other species that are fished for there, too, are like way more commercially valuable than the tanner crab, so those haven't seen as many closures in the past, so they're more of a continual fishery, and they're like a serious means of livelihood for commercial fishermen up there, but the tanner crab is more of like a supplemental fishery, so like if it's open, the fishermen will go and fish for it, but if it's closed, it's not a big deal because there's other species for them to catch. Did you come across anything talking about like seafood fraud essentially, like between those crab species? Because like obviously the other crabs are more commercially valuable than tanner crab, but could tanner crab be supplementing like illegally and being mislabeled? I saw like a little bit of in papers where sometimes I should have just have a hard time identifying yeah. or like differentiating between the crabs. I mean we put up a picture of yeah, the snow and tanner that they look the same. Yeah, I yeah, I think I I read something that said that a lot of times they're sold as snow crabs. Um, yeah. and just it's not really mentioned that they're tanner crabs, but they're so similar that it's probably like a combination of fishermen not really taking the time to differentiate it. Um, I do know though that like if you are caught selling tanner crabs and snow crabs, like it's a pretty like, big penalty. So there is some enforcement. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's I mean, it's an Alaskan fishery, so enforcement is like the yeah. major <laughs> the major issue up there. <laughs>
Well, good questions, all of that. I had the same question about other analogous decapod fisheries. You know, it's good to look at other fisheries in the same area that are managed under the same regime and ask why would it be, why would it be different? So, good, good questions all around. I have a, a question for you, Peter. With um, you put up the plot of FSSI, mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously a, a new metric, um, yeah. kind of interesting. Uh, maybe we could put that back oh, up yeah. if you can, if you can find it. Um, and so I guess I have two questions on this. One is, uh, would be sort of if you were presenting, say, to, to Congress or something, and someone would say, well, is this better? And then if it is better, why aren't we using it? And then I guess the other question I have for you as well is, did you make this up, FSSY? Is this from some other paper? No, this is actually a metric that is used by NOAA. Mm -hmm. So um, the only reason I used this, though, was because of the lack of the you know, FSSY data. So this was like a supplemental way of classifying the fishery that was like available in this large chart um, that has the fishery and whether it's experienced with fishing or not, um, and all sorts of other information. Um, it's all in like stock, uh, stock assessments online. Um, but I guess in terms of <laughs> confronting Congress, um, I mean, I personally don't think this is like, I guess this is the best way that they can do it <laughs> because it's not as commercially important as some of the other species that fish there. So um, I guess this kind of just like serves what their needs are <laughs> for the region. So since it's not commercially fished for all the time, they'll just allow these fishermen to have a little supplemental income. And then when it's getting too close to extinction, they'll they'll lock it down and say, all right, let it be built and come back. So, I mean, I personally don't think this is a very good strategy. I think that they should just shut it down for like 20 years and just let it completely come back and then sort of do a whole new management plan, but um, that's like not very realistic at the moment. So. Right. And so I guess the question is, just as a metric then, if you were to follow your plan, <clears throat> what metric would you use after 20 years of a... I would use pure on the SY data. The fact that like it's becoming more accurate within from 2008 onwards is like a promising uh, that's like that's good <laughs> so I think that they should continue to use that especially with uh, crustaceans in such a localized area it's like it's a lot easier for them to get an accurate assessment of populations since these fish aren't highly migratory or these crabs aren't highly migratory and they're sticking to one spot so Calculating a B over BM squad for these are it's actually pretty easy since they're not moving around very much. Mm, good, okay. So the, it is more sensitive than FSSI. Yeah, I mean, if, ideally, I would have used B over BM squad data, but mm -hmm. I mean, the fishery only started in the 60s and the B over BM squad was only around in 2008 onwards, so I kind of thought that was a good justification to use it. Right, yeah, no, no, good explanation. Right, it is good to put a citation on there uh, yeah. if it's not your own work so that you know that know where it's coming from. Yep. I guess on that same question, I have, I have one question for you. You had said um, that uh, you find the term sustainable to be misleading. So perhaps it's a similar question to saying, how do these metrics compare? Yeah. If the term sustainable isn't useful, what is a useful term and how do we define and measure that? Um, well, Oh, I think it would be a good question. Um, so, like Peter said, I mean, the, I, I guess the, I was referring to um, the number 2.61, although that is technically sustainable, um, it's not an accurate reflection of what our fishery is. Um, and in terms of terminology, I guess I'm kind of confused by the question. You, you, do, you, you just like, don't want us to use the term no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just wondering when you said, I, I thought you had said perhaps the term was, was misleading, but I think what you might have meant is it's misleading to define Four. sustainability as just B over BMSY. Um, I meant that it's misleading to define our fishery, so the tanner crab, as a sustainable fishery. Gotcha. That's misleading. That the, um, the idea that a value of 2.61 right. as sustainable is not necessarily an accurate reflection for our fishery. Well, that's a good comment then. So, if it was to be sustainable, and we and we weren't using V over V M S Y, how would we define sustainability? Just any other ideas? Um. Well, I mean, I also just think that like 
be just looking at the over BMS fly alone is not going to help us assess, obviously, how sustainable these fisheries. Um, so then also just looking at uh, stock assessments and then also furthering individualized research on the canner crab um, to actually come up with accurate stock assessment data and really analyzing the populations <laughs> and looking at that um, kind of a more, there's just obviously a need for a much more holistic approach to um, determining what makes a fishery sustainable rather than just looking at the over BMSY, which is the issue that like, well, if you were to just look at this number, 2.61, like it looks sustainable, but you know, if we look at um, landing data and we look at and we put more research into actually coming coming up with like very specific um, stock assessments and population data, that like it would paint a very different picture for what sustainable is. Interesting, great, good explanation. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to kind of add on to that in terms of like classifying the fishery sustainable. Um, I think that it's just indicative of the fact that there aren't, we, I mean, we all kind of use a lot of the same sources because there isn't that much information on the tanner crab, but, you know, I personally didn't find any kind of, like, predictions for the long term or any kind of forecast about what they think will happen to the fishery by constantly shutting it down and then opening again. Um, and it's not, you know, especially with, like, rising um, sea temperatures, which the Bering Sea will eventually form, probably. Um, and like they just don't really know what's going to happen. They're just operating basically year by year. Um, and so they're just going to be interested in it. And by saying it's sustainable, it's not really that sustainable in terms of the future. So I'm just like, I think also, like, it would be if we didn't have the over BSY data, like a, a reputable way of classifying as a sale, we'd be seeing a lot less boom and bust throughout the years. So. I mean, we've seen three closures in 50 years, um, which is pretty unheard of, especially in, in the Alaskan fishery, which we would classify as well managed. So I think that if we saw like a less boom and bust cycle, more of like a linear tra trajectory of these landings, or even just like a flat line, I think that would be a lot, like that would be a, a better way to classify it as a sustainable fishery. Gotcha, good answer, yeah. Yeah, interesting. So. If you could go for 50 years with no boom and bust closures, then right. you'd say, okay, now you get the yes. moniker. Clearly something's working then if it's, it's like that. Yeah. Oh, good. good explanations, yeah. Great, thanks. Any further questions? I think that's it. Hmm? Okay.